opportunity to be here today. I'm not going to make a call. I just want to make sure to be mindful of my time. So I'm going to talk to you today about buildings and health. So if that's not what you're here to listen for, you know, you're in for a surprise. I want to start off with a little story. I've always been blessed with, hang on, I went too fast. I've always been blessed with very good dental health. Thanks much to my mom who's here from Atlanta today with her friend Joan. So thanks mom. But I had a little problem tooth and I had to go get a root canal. So needless to say, I was not very excited about that. Um, and it's a stressful experience if you've never had one before. But I went to the endodontist and that was my view as I was sitting in the chair. And it's like, wow. And if you step back a little bit farther, this huge plate glass window to this beautiful vegetated courtyard in a pond where I could watch the fish and the little frog was sitting on the wall the whole time. And it helped to take my mind off of what was getting ready to happen to me. So I asked the endodontist, I said, what, what inspired you to do this? And he said, you know, our, our staff, they're inside all day long and we want to create a pleasant environment for our staff and we want to do the same thing for our patients. And I really thought it was, it was quite interesting that, that he was thinking of his staff on the equal level and maybe even a little bit above his patients. I probably shouldn't say above his patients, he wouldn't like me for that. But it goes to show the importance of having a built environment that inspires us and a place where we want to be. And so that's what I'm going to talk about today. You know, we all have been in rooms that inspire us. We've been in rooms that depress us. So I think we know just on an intrinsic level that there is some sort of a connection. But we know that it's much more just than an intrinsic connection. We have the medical research to back it up. And this research has been recently embodied into a standard called the Well Building Standard. So much of the information that I'm going to talk about today comes from the research and the recommendations that are included in the standard. And the standard has been vetted by medical professionals nationally and internationally, including the Mayo Clinic, the Cleveland Clinic, um, and lots of practitioners, and many, many man hours have gone into the development of this standard. But before I launch into that, I really want to start with a basic understanding of what is health. Because when we think about health, a lot of times we think if we're not sick, we're healthy. Well, as you can see by the definition from the World Health Organization, health is the state of complete physical, we think about the physical all the time, right? But also mental and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease. So just because you don't have a disease doesn't necessarily mean you are very healthy. So I hope through our conversation today, you'll have some takeaways that you can take back with you much of what I'll talk about this afternoon will be geared more towards a professional audience, but certainly there's recommendations and ideas that you can take back to your personal home or wherever you may spend a lot of your time. So they told me I should pick up 10 tips. So here's number one, right? So how do buildings affect us? Well, we spend on average up to 90% of our time indoors, which that in itself is problematic, but we're not here to talk about that today but certainly it has an impact on the air that we breathe. So the first thing I want to share with you, it's little things called volatile organic compounds or VOCs. These are bad. These are the things that give you the new building smell, the new car smell, and we should work diligently to not have those aromas in our environments because over time, these can lead to serious chronic issues. And for many people, they have severe allergies or reactions to volatile organic compounds. Now, where do you find these crazy things? They are in all sorts of materials. They are in paint. Fortunately, paint is so easy to get with low or no VOCs. You can pick it up at the same cost as regular paint these days. It used to be it was more expensive, but that premium has gone away. They are, can be in materials like air fresheners. So when you're putting something into the air or when you're cleaning with something and it has a smell, think about what's causing that smell. More often than not, it's some sort of chemical. And over time, those can have an impact on our personal health. The image at the bottom shows a room 
much like this one covered with carpet. Carpet can have a lot of off-gassing, and off-gassing is the term that we use when these volatile organic compounds are released over time. So when you first go into a building that might have a lot of these, these VOCs, you'll notice it a very strong aroma when you first walk in, and over time it dissipates, but they're still there. Now you can buy materials, carpets, that don't have them. Ideally, if you're able to use a surface rug instead of wall-to-wall -wall carpeting, um, it's preferred for a number of different reasons, one of the main ones being cleaning. It's extremely difficult to get carpet clean all the way. If you've ever removed carpet and looked underneath it, you'll know what I'm talking about. But how do you know, right? How do you know if you're buying the right thing? Fortunately, there are a number of different organizations that provide independent third-party verification of various products. Um, these are examples of just a few. Uh, Green Seal, you may have heard of. The one on the upper right, the Eco logo, is from Underwriter uh, Laboratories, UL, which tests everything under the sun. Um, Declare is one that was developed by um, the Living Building Institute up in the Pacific Northwest. And Cradle to Cradle, um, you'll see this on a lot of products. Uh, Method, for example, that you can buy at Target, um, has the Cradle Cradle label, and a lot of these, a lot of various products do. Not promoting any of them, but the good thing about many of these these label, all the labels that are up here, these are third-party certifications. So the manufacturer has nothing to do with actually certifying the product. So if somebody self-certifies their own product, in my mind, it doesn't really mean a whole lot because it's easy to say, hey, we're great, we're doing great things, but if somebody else is saying it for you, that really has much more meaning behind it. But what can we do if they're already in the air? We can open the windows, right? Natural ventilation is good, even if it's just 15 minutes a day. Now you have to use common sense, and in the middle of July, when it's like 99% humidity, it might not be the best time. Or in the springtime, when we have the blanket of yellow that descends upon Savannah, that might not be the best time. But natural ventilation is something we have gotten away from as a society, but it can be really beneficial for the air that we breathe. Intakes. So this one is an air intake for your HVAC system. If you are doing any type of construction or renovation, cover these up cover up all your duct work to try and avoid dust getting inside of them. This one on the right is a fresh air intake. So your air conditioning system can have a fresh air intake on the outside of the building, but pay attention to where you place it. Somewhere you do not want to place it, next to your carpool line where you have cars idling. Even better, and this is a special shout out for my friend Karen, establish no idling zones. You cannot idle in a car for more than 30 seconds. And this is a very reasonable length of time, and it also saves the driver on gas. Number two, buildings can influence what we eat and drink. So some of the things I'm going to talk about are not only from the buildings, but also from the policy perspective as well, and maybe corporate policies that are set sometimes. Um, you know, we all know that a grocery store has product placement that's premium. So they want to put certain products at your eye level so you will gravitate visually to those first. And we can use those, that same principle when we are providing food for lunches, such as today, or when we're providing a, a, an ongoing cafeteria selection um, like they do in some of the larger employers. And even if you are having a catered lunch, these are some tips that you can follow to help people make healthier choices. People are like water. We're going to take the path of least resistance. So if you have a plate and the veggies are first and you get some veggies, it's a kind of a subconscious cue that maybe you'll get a little less of what's not quite as healthy for you. So that's the idea behind this. Think about trading out the candy jar for something a little bit healthier. Our friends at Google tried this experiment and at their office in New York City over a seven week period, they had a decrease of 3.1 million calories in a seven week period simply by changing out the candy jar to something a little bit healthier. Fruits, nuts, and now they provide this all the time for their employees. I'm gonna talk about Google a fair bit um, because they're doing some really cool and innovative stuff and really setting some good examples for maybe something that shouldn't be abnormal but should become the norm. This one is one of my favorites. I first saw this, I think, at the Savannah Airport. So if you're not familiar with this, this is, this is at the Habersham YMCA water fountain that has the water bottle refiller dispenser in the back. And this, the advantage of this is it fills up your water bottle like that. It's very fast, it's very convenient, it's fresh filtered water, 
and it's better for you than drinking out of the plastic bottles. If you use a plastic water bottle, use it once and recycle it. Please don't refill it over and over and over. The, wa the plastic is designed to break down and it leaches into your water. So that has nothing to do with buildings, but just a, just a tip. Look for this instead. Better for you, better for the planet. Yeah, I mean, if it's, if it's designed to be reusable and it's a BPA-free, yeah, those are, I'm talking about the plastic, like the Dasani water bottles. That's nothing but tap water anyways. So instead of paying $2 for tap water that's put into a plastic bottle, get your reusable canteen and fill it there. Now, if you feel like you have to have vending machines, that's okay. But think about putting them somewhere where they're not quite as easy to get to. So, so that people have to maybe take a few extra steps or maybe they have to go outside. Um, so you know, there's different ways to talk about these strategies and how we can get them to work together for a healthier community. Which leads me to my next one of how we move. I love to talk about stairs, it's just so easy. Um, you know, if you have a building with an elevator, this is in a two-story building. The elevator is always open. So remember what I said, people are like water, they take the path of least resistance. If the stairs are labeled as the area of refuge and the elevator says, come to me, where are most people more likely to go? They're going to take the elevator, right? But what if the stairs look like this, right? This beautiful sculpture in the atrium. Oh, I wonder what the view looks like from up there. Um, now, not everybody is physically able, and so certainly we need to have elevators and ADA compliance uh, be very mindful of that. But for those who are physically able, it's a really easy way, again, to play to that subconscious of getting more physical activity. We sometimes think that exercise is something we have to carve out in our day. We absolutely do not. I'm here to advocate for exercise as a way of life so that it doesn't become something else you have to do. It simply becomes the way you live. So these are the stairs that are actually in my office building. Um, when I first moved in, they were not particularly attractive. I think I was the only one who ever used them. And I didn't put it in here, but I hung up a little sign that, that Paula knows about that said, you know, why not take the stairs? They burn twice as many calories or whatever the statistic is. So, oh, so I've been in this office building for six years, and over time, I noticed more and more people taking the stairs. I don't know if I had anything to do with it, but I'll take a little credit. And the stairs now look like this. So the building owners, I do not own the building. The building owners did a wonderful job of painting the stairs. They have the, it's a beautiful historic building with this great mosaic tile floor. They added sconces. They painted the stairs. They were kept clean. It's now, I see people in the stairway all the time, which is fantastic. Where your building is located is incredibly important as well. Now, if you're in an office building, you can't necessarily move it. But if you are the head of your company and you have some influence over where your next building can go, maybe you do. And something else I'll talk about is even if you're not the boss, having the opportunity to provide input to the boss. So this you may recognize as Forsyth Park. And you know, you've got a gentleman who is presumably riding leisurely. You've got someone who may be commuting, someone else who may be commuting by skateboard. So opportunities for active transportation. You know, this gentleman could be out on his lunch hour. So again, if you have an office building and you are able to provide a shower, that is a great benefit for your employees so that you can either walk or bike to work and then clean up, go out of their lunchtime, go to the gym. Many employers are providing incentives um, for their employees to be able to go to exercise facilities. And why not, right? So this is your brain sitting, this is your brain on exercise, right? These are, these are brain scans of children and the one on the right is after 20 minutes of physical activity. And you can just see the increase in the neurological activity just from 20 minutes of exercise. Our personal comfort. <laughs> Anybody ever look like this at work? You were just sitting there going, oh. So my first office, I used to go outside in the sun and I would thermoregulate and just soak in the sun rays because that would be so cold. Sometimes it's because you have somebody like this who's going colder, 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 colder. And, and having the opportunities for personalized comfort, sometimes it's easier than others. But if there is the opportunity to do that, many times it can be worthwhile, and there's great technologies to help make that happen now. So this is a ductless air conditioning system. 
that's very easy to install. So if the, you know, if somebody in the corner office is, they're the only one that's always cold and everybody else is miserable and suffering, maybe it's worth putting in some more air conditioning units. Again, the opportunity for individuals to be able to open up their own windows. I love that I can open my office window. You know, we used to design for this. You know, we used to have transoms up above windows that helped to circulate the air. We've become so reliant on technology and on our mechanical systems that we've gotten away from common sense design. But there's opportunities to bring that back. You know, buildings, again, from a fresh air perspective, designing a building where air can naturally ventilate through, heat can naturally escape, these are great strategies to make it more comfortable for us. Ergonomics, you know, having the opportunity to have a desk, whether it's a standing desk or one that can change position. Again, this encourages the employees to be able to move around during the day and not be so sedentary. Some people like these, some people don't, and that's okay. But providing a variety of work environments helps encourage people to be able to move around throughout the day. Another way that buildings affect us is through how we sleep. Probably heard about the circadian rhythm, right? So the circadian rhythm has been affected over time um, greatly because of the changes in our lifestyle. So one of the major factors of this is light, which I'll talk about in just a moment, but there are other elements that can impact our circadian rhythm. In our normal circadian rhythm, so the, the blue is our sleep need and the red is the sleep urge. So, you know, early afternoon, there's that peak where many of us are like, oh, you feel lazy. So what do you do? I'll go get a cup of coffee. Oh, we get look for artificial stimulants. What if we just took a nap? <laughs> so our friends at Google have these great little napping pods. I want one for my office. I will never be able to afford it. But it doesn't have to be this elaborate. Simply having a space that's not the desk where somebody can go sit and relax for 10, 15 minutes. It doesn't mean you have to take a nap, but somewhere where you can just decompress for a few minutes take a mental break, have a change in environment, can do so much to increase the productivity through the remainder of the afternoon. But if you want to take a nap, our friends at the Savannah Morning News say, that's okay. And I'm a power napper, I learned that from mom too. Um, and I will shut my door and lean my head back on my chair for 10 minutes, wake up and I'll be good to go. Some people can do it, some people can't. I'm personally huge, I know Paul is like, I can do it. Some people can, I am thrilled that I can. Not always, I don't do it every day. The light we use. Buildings obviously have a huge impact. And I mentioned a moment ago, this is one of the biggest um, impacts on the disruptions to our circadian rhythms. Probably all seen the news reports of, you know, evil cell phones at night. The blue light is what disrupts our circadian rhythm. And there's all sorts of, you know, influences that it impacts. Um, there's some evidence that over time it can damage your retinas. It can, you know, potentially lead to cataracts, potentially be a cause of cancer, obesity risk, depression, neurotoxins, makes it harder to learn, affects your memory. Holy cow, I'm depressed. So those are simple practices that we can institute ourselves, right? Again, our friends at the Savannah Morning News have picked up on this light issue too. This is an article written by a local columnist, Mary Landers, talking about the new street lights in Savannah and some of the medical community says they're not so great because of the blue light that is emitted and can disrupt the circadian rhythm. So the more that we learn about those lighting impacts, the more that we can understand how we can design better. And we didn't used to have to worry about this so much because we spent more time outside. And so the sunlight took care of these things for us. And now that we've changed that so much, we need to think mindfully about how we can better mimic nature for our own well-being. Um, this is embarrassing, but this is my office, and yes, it's a mess. Um, but I want to point out a couple of things here. So these windows, I know it looks like there's a glare. I promise there's really not. It's just, but these windows face north. Northern facing windows are fabulous because you can get natural light all day long without the glare. If you have an, a window in your office, the best position for your computer is perpendicular so that your screen does not get the direct glare from the light. Um, I have a little office plant, I have my water on the desk, I have my refillable water bottle. And this isn't staged, I promise, it's just the way it is. So it's easy to make these adaptations into your own office. And people think my desk might look a little bit strange because it's turned perpendicular to the window, but that's really the best way to be. And I can also overlook Ellis Square, so that helps. So if you have a light that brings more natural light in, so one of the things we need to think about is glare. So we don't wanna create glare even though we want to increase natural daylight. 
and there's a lot of different strategies, but one that I'll point out really quick, because I think they're awesome, it's called light shelves. So in the winter, I mean, I'm sorry, in the summer, we, want, we don't want this light coming directly into our windows. So this light shelf is this little, and I'll show you another picture in just a minute, it's a little thing that sticks out that bounces the light off of that onto the ceiling and then back into the room. So you get the benefit of natural daylight without having the direct glare. Then in the winter, when you want the warmth of the sun's rays coming in, they can come, the sun can come under those light shelves. So this is what it looks like from the exterior. So these are exterior light shelves that are also providing shading, right? And then on the inside, this isn't necessarily the same building, but this is one example of what they could look like where you have the light coming in, bouncing off the white ceiling, and then back into the workspace here. You know, there's so many different strategies to talk about daylighting. Um, this is an office in Atlanta the, um, that is a LEED Platinum certified office. It's absolutely amazing. But you can see these, these beautiful windows. These are automatic shades that come down when the sun starts coming directly into the building. They have this great outdoor workspace for their employees. Lots of natural light. So no one person has a window. Everybody has a window. What we see, Karen, here's your tree. <laughs> What we see is almost as important as having that access to the natural daylight. And that's because of something called biophilia. As human beings, we are inherently connected to nature and we have a natural love of nature. And the more that we can enhance that, the better off we are for our health. Now, we can't all build a house in the wood or over a waterfall like Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, and some might say this is a little bit too into nature. Um, but we can, we can use that inspiration and create opportunities, even though we're inside, to still have that access to natural views. And it doesn't have to be a huge wooded area like you might have here. Even in an urban environment, you can look for opportunities. So this is a very small green area, but you have shade trees, you have uh, visual variation and direct views to nature. Um, if you don't have the opportunity to do that, there's these great things that my friend Laura Lee can tell you more about made by DIRT. Um, these living walls, and DIRT stands for doing it right this time. These living walls, um, here you go, that you can provide vegetation inside and bring some of the nature inside. And these are, DIRT has a manufacturing facility here in Savannah, so they're a great employer and great examples. Um, they provide healthy food for their employees, so sorry, I don't work for them, I swear, but they do great stuff. Um, but trees and nature also help us socially, they help us mentally, they can help reduce anger and mental frustration. So the, the benefits of vegetation go on and on and on and more that I can talk about today. So number eight, for productivity, I get it done, right? So buildings have a hu huge impact there. So if we have access to natural daylight, if we have access to vegetation, we see a 15% increase in productivity. And for you employers out there, what's your most expensive cost? Your people, right? So if you can have a more productive workforce, you can have a happier workforce, everybody wins. And we know that in environments with access to natural views and daylight, we see a 10 to 25% uh, increase in mental and memory function. We see test scores go up. So just letting the students have access to these, to nature, and to light and to fresh air and pleasant acoustics, five to 15% higher test scores, hospital stays eight and a half percent shorter. And this is huge when we're talking about the medical crisis that we're facing in our country. If we simply design healthier environments, it helps the bottom line of our community. Again, for you employers out there, every dollar you spend in healthcare and in wellness, $6 return. Pretty good investment, right? Our mental health. So I talked about at the beginning, it's not just our physical health, but our mental health as well. Beauty is a big part of that. A place that inspires, does so much for our mental health. A place where we want to be. We can look for designs that are designed simply to be pleasing to people. They may not even have a function, but it's somewhere, it creates a pleasant and beautiful space. It celebrates the culture, it celebrates spirit, it celebrates the local sense of place integrates public art. These are all strategies you can use to enhance the beauty. Having spaces that are designed intentionally for collaboration among your team members. And then having other spaces that are intentionally designed for quiet and for respite. Or if you're at 
Google. <laughs> you can have a little, I think a little termite colony or hive or whatever, but there's a reason why Google gets the best and the brightest, right? They create a work environment that inspires. They have, you can, going down the stairs, you can take a slide, you can go find the hidden tunnel. These are all, you know, the conventional wisdom is, no, we must sit and be chained to our desk and work, work, work. If you can create an environment that inspires, then you have healthy, happy, and productive employees. And number 10, our engagement. So this gets more to policy, but companies who get it are doing some things to really encourage engagement among their team members. So I mentioned earlier about engaging your team. If you're making decisions about where your office is going to maybe relocate, or what your policies are going to be, or how you are going to renovate, engage your team. They then feel they are a part of the process, and they also become more, uh, it improves their own mental health and their own productivity. Providing maternity and paternity leave so that those with a new family can spend the quality time needed and not feel the stress, <laughs> bless you, and not feel the stress and the tug and pull and be able to adapt to having that new family member. And then serving your community and engaging with your community. Having opportunities for employees to be able to go on a work day and engage in public service with their community. So that wraps up my 10 ways that buildings impact your health and your wellness um, in life, and I hope it's been beneficial, and if we have time for questions, I'm happy to answer them. <laughs>